great song. I just, I love that. We'll sing it again in a year. <laughs> it's so good to see you today. You know, I, may, I must make an apology. Uh, last Sunday, Pastor H.B. London brought a phenomenal year-end, New Year message to all of us. I miscommunicated to those people who do our video and get our message on the internet. I told them that, that we would not be needing them on the last Sunday of January. I didn't communicate that clearly. And they heard, I don't, I, I, maybe I said it, how do I know now? Uh, but I'm taking all the blame. And so that great message is not in the archives of some of the great sermons in the history of the church. And uh, I've, had, uh, I've had a lot of calls this week, uh, two I think, and uh, wondering, uh, wondering where is that message? And w one person even said, do you have it in print? And, uh, but I, I really, I, they, and I'm taking all the blame. And uh, so it will, it will be, and somebody even asked me at the door today, in the future, could he bring that message again? So I think that would be good. Could you put that in your schedule? Five years from now, we will, uh, we will have him bring that message again. No, that was a, it, was a, it was a phenomenal message to end the year. And uh, I, so I'm taking all the blame. And uh, so don't blame anybody but me. And I have, uh, I, I, that, that, I'm glad I did it last year because uh, I needed to make a mistake last year. And I waited, I waited till almost the end of the year to make, finally make a mistake. Mistake. So I, I, I thought that would be good. Um, th this morning, uh, let me leave you a rather lengthy passage, but I've, it, I've got a theme today. And so the theme is found in my passage. If you have anything to write with, and somebody walked out of the first service and showed me their program, it, they just had stuff written all around it. Uh, but uh, if you, I'm going to leave you a lot of scriptures today, but I'm not going to give you time to turn to them except this one in Exodus chapter 16. I'm going to begin reading at verse 14 because I have a theme today. I don't have an expository sermon. I've got a theme today that I want to bring to you on this new year, how, the, how to be spiritually strong in the new year. So uh, if you want to do that, if you want to jot down some scriptures, you can do that. And, uh, and uh, you could even get them on the, if, which you couldn't do last year, you could get it on the video this afternoon that will be on the internet. But uh, anyway, uh, the background for our scripture uh, passage today, you know the children of Israel had been enslaved in Egypt, and they were on their way now to the promised land, but that's a big problem when you're leading that amount of people, hundreds of thousands of people, and cattle, and all their belongings. You, I think one of the big problems is not only the, not only the wear and tear on the body, but how are you going to sustain people that long with food? And God made a provision. It was, a, it was not a, it was not a 40 year provision. It was a daily provision. And that's the way God comes to meet us. We don't see the end of the story. We don't see the end of the journey. But we have a promise that God is going to be with us today. And then God has some expectations of us that we take our day and use that day that we can continue to have spiritual strength and growth. So if, you, if you've turned to Exodus chapter 16, I begin reading at verse 14. When the dew evaporated, a flaky substance, fine as frost, blanketed the ground. The Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. What is it? They asked each other. They had no idea what it was. And Moses told them, it is the food the Lord has given you to eat. These are the Lord's instructions. Each household shall gather as much as it needs. Pick up two quarts for each person in your tent. So the people of Israel did as they were told. Some gathered a lot, some only a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over. And those who gathered only a little had enough. Each family had just what it needed. Then Moses told them, do not keep any of it until morning. But some of them didn't listen and kept some of it until morning. But by then it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell. 
Moses was very angry with them. After this, the people gathered the food morning by morning, each family according to its needs. And as the sun became hot, the flakes they had not picked up melted and disappeared. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much as usual, four quarts for each person instead of two. Then all the leaders of the community came and asked Moses for an explanation. He told them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath day set apart for the Lord. So bake or boil as much as you want today and set aside what is left for tomorrow. So they put some aside until morning, just as Moses had commanded them. And in the morning, the leftover food was wholesome and good without maggots or odor. Moses said, eat this food today, for today is a Sabbath day dedicated to the Lord. There will be no food on the ground today. You may gather the food for six days, but the seventh day is a Sabbath. There will be no food on the ground that day. Some of the people went out anyway. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? How we, we, we haven't changed really, have we? We don't listen to what the Lord says. So, it, so some of the people went out anyway on the seventh day and they found no food. And the Lord asked Moses, how long will these people refuse to obey my commands and instructions? They must realize that the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. That is why he gives you a two-day supply on the sixth day. So there will be enough for two days. On the Sabbath day, you must each stay in your place. Do not go out to pick up food on the seventh day. So the people did not gather any food on the seventh day. I want to leave you one more verse, and this is in my top ten of verses. 3 John 2. It's just, that's that little epistle in the back. And John is writing to Pastor Gaius. And in John chapter 3, verse 2, it says, I wish that you might prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Isn't that a great verse? And I think that's God's promise for us in the new year, that we might prosper and be in health as our soul prospers. Now, just for a little historical background as a base for this message in the new year, Luke gives us in Acts chapter 18, verse 23, one of the Apostle Paul's priority tasks. He, it says, after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region, strengthening all the disciples. Paul had a great concern wherever Christians were found, wherever Christ followers were found, that they be strengthened and that they grow and become mature in, in their faith. His first concern was to get people converted. Uh, use any word you want there to see that they were born again, to see them saved, so to see them turn into a new creature in Christ Jesus, whatever term we want to use. But that was Paul's chief concern, was to see people come to a saving relationship with Jesus. He did this wherever he went. Whether he was in prison, whether he was in the palace, where he, whether he was out in the open air, he did it with Jews and he did it with Gentiles. Acts chapter 20 verse 17 says, now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and testifying in, and teaching you in public and from house to house and testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Acts 20, chapter 26, verse 22 and 3, to this day I have had the help that comes from God, so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must surf, first suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. That was his primary message. His number one concern was to bring people into a relationship with Jesus. But that was not the end of his concern. He had a second driving concern and that was to see people built up in the faith. The task of the church is not only evangelism, but is consolidation. 
Not only to see people saved and brought to faith in Jesus, but to see them grow. It's a tragic thing if we are one who received Christ as our Savior, and that was our entry point, but it also became our ending point. And we never grew beyond that place, and we have remained spiritually babes. Uh, I love babies. Uh, they're just so much fun, especially if they're somebody else's babies. Uh, I just, I love babies. Uh, they're so much fun. They're fun to hold, and they, they're just fun to play with. But I'll tell you what's a little bit discouraging is in the church when, when babies are 50 years old, and they're still babies, and you still got to cuddle them and cuddle them. And, uh, you know, it's okay. You can put up with a baby when they're small. Uh, but it's, it, it's pretty tough to change a 50-year-old diaper. And, uh, and, and that, and that, in the church, we've got people that have never gone beyond the place of the entry place. And that was Paul's desire that we continue to grow. Now, there are some simple steps to be taken for spiritual growth. And I'm going to leave you four spiritual, simple steps that we can take in this new year to produce spiritual growth in our lives. First of all, we need to eat plenty of good food. Now, I think I, I, a lot of us, uh, we, we love to do this when the new year begins. We always make that resolution that we're going to lose weight. And, but I, I think the Lord has a spiritual balance diet for us for, with some good food. And we need to eat good food. And we need to eat plenty of good food. And we, uh, we need to assimilate God's wonderful good food that he provides. Uh, we, so we talk about that manna today. But did you notice when they got the manna? They got it every morning. They, took a, they got a new supply of food every day. Yesterday's intake will not be good enough to sustain us today and so we must have a fresh supply every day we must feed on the Word of God like Jeremiah in Jeremiah 15 16 he says as your words came to me I drink them in and they fill my heart with joy and happiness because I belong to you O Lord the God who rules over all Hebrews 5 verses 12 13 and 14 talk about the milk and the, the meat of the word so we need both milk and meat into the in this balanced diet that the Lord has for us now uh, I uh, and yes last Sunday we encouraged you um, and, and uh, uh, several hundred of you here now have received a one-year Bible uh, my one-year Bible was out this morning I got a little jump a little head start on it so um, I feel good about that because I always I always am concerned that what would happen if someday came along but so I was in my one-year Bible this morning and a little devotional book but uh, and, uh, and, and last Sunday I talked about that uh, maybe that maybe reading the Bible through in a year for some of you is becomes an insurmountable task so why don't you do something uh, maybe and in the in the in the front of the one-year Bible there was some counsel for us if you feel like you can't read it through in one year read the New Testament through this year uh, maybe next year read the Old Testament through maybe maybe read just the Psalms and the Proverbs through uh, I practice a discipline for several years in a row did you know and you do know there there are thir 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs one for every day of the of the month that's a wonderful discipline and maybe you would like to supplement your Bible reading this year by reading the co corresponding chapter in the Proverbs now there's only two books in the Bible that have promises connected to them the book of Revelation said if you'll read this book you'll be blessed didn't say you had to understand it just said read it and uh, so uh, I may not understand it but I read it because I want to get blessed the book of Proverbs says this one is really good for me the book of Proverbs says if you will read this book you will gain wisdom and nobody knows more than I do that I need wisdom I need I need to get some wisdom so that's why every day 
I read some of the Proverbs. And uh, you might do that discipline. You know what's nice about the Proverbs, or interesting, I should say, is it's, it, it, it's not a book that you can read by, you can take this, I'm going to read this chapter today because it talks about raising kids. Or I'm going to read this chapter today because it talks about relations. No, they're just like little models all through the book of Proverbs. You can take them, you can plaster them on the, the wall of your soul or on your refrigerator or wherever. Because they, there are a lot of little standalone verses. They all stand alone. Maybe there's two or three connected together. But there's no continuity in the book of Proverbs. But it, they're, they're wonderful to read. So I want to encourage you to make that part of your uh, getting your nourishment this year. Your spiritual food. The word becomes our life. Jesus said in John 6, 63, It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you our spirit and life there is no substitute for this kind of nourishment it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God so we need to have some spiritual food for spiritual growth in the new year secondly we need to breathe plenty of fresh air now, I think that our fresh air that we breathe is necessary for our, to be spiritually fit and well, to get plenty of fresh air. And I believe that as the Word of God speaks to us and is our food, that prayer becomes our air that we breathe. Uh, the place and the posture of prayer is not important. Now, some people, we remember how Daniel prayed with the windows open toward Jerusalem. We remember how Peter prayed on the housetop. Uh, there were all different kinds of, uh, Daniel prayed in a lion's den. God help me from getting there. Uh, but there, there, there were different places and positions of prayer. Uh, I read somebody said, I always pray kneeling forward. And I went to church and they said it was time to pray, but there were no kneelers uh, connected to the pew in front of me. And I had a difficult time praying because I was used to that form of prayer by kneeling forward. Some people pray with their hands lifted. Some people pray with their heart crossed. Some people pray standing. That's the only way they can pray. Other people say you can only pray when you're kneeling. Other people pray with their head on the ground, on the floor. But the posture of our prayer is not important. It's the condition of our heart that's important. Uh, you've heard me say before, it was a poem. I don't know the poem. But these guys were arguing about the place and the position of prayer. And they were did they just went through some of the things that I've gone through. And another guy said to them, one day I fell in a well. And the prayingest prayer I ever prayed was standing on my head. And so that was, his, that was his most effective prayer when he was standing on his head upside down in, in a well. So it, the position is not important. It's the condition of our heart that is extremely important. We need to develop the attitude of prayer. When I was a student, uh, the president of the college invited, uh, I, I, even as a kid, I saw him as a mystic, uh, John Wright Follett. Uh, he was never married. Uh, he kind of lived like a monk, uh, all alone. And uh, I remember, and it, it offended me as a young person. I thought, he shouldn't be saying this to, to young people. He said, uh, young men and women, uh, there, I want you to know there are days that I never pray. And I thought, boy, he shouldn't be saying that. We should, he should be telling us that we need to be praying every day. He said, uh, Jesus and I live together. Uh, he said, I get up in the morning and I go ha make a little breakfast for myself, but Jesus is on the other side of the table and we talk together while I'm having breakfast. He said, I just, I, he, he's with me all day long. That's a wonderful place to live. Uh, I, I brought a group of young men from uh, the university uh, on, on two, two different occasions. I brought them down to the Institute for Successful Church Leadership and got, a, got an, an audience, an appointment with Dr. Schuler. If he would talk with them for a few minutes in his office. 
So I took them there, and one time one of these young men rather uh, brazenly said to Dr. Schuler, would you please tell us about your prayer life? And I thought, that's a pretty, pretty uh, a brave thing for a young man to say. And Dr. Schuler looked at these uh, young guys and said, uh, my, my formal prayer life may not be much to talk about, but he said, young man, I want you to know, I talk, God and I talk together all day long. And he's talking to me all day, and I'm talking to him, and he tells me stuff. And when he tells me things, that's what I do. When God, because God and I, that's a wonderful way to live. Where we can have God with us at all times, and we're always talking to him. Uh, I, I think if we can develop that attitude, we can learn to pray for the neighbors as we drive by. Uh, we can learn to pray for the guy that cut us off in traffic. Uh, we can learn to pray for the Canadians that are driving in the fast lane in the f very slow speed. Uh, th th there's, a, there's a lot of things that we can pray for as, as, we're, as, we're, as we're out, out and about in this world. Uh, I was expecting the Canadians to get up and walk out in mass right then. And, and I, I was looking. I was trying to get the doors open. For the, but uh, uh, but there's, there's, and aren't you thankful that we have immediate access to God? We don't have to wait. We don't have to get to a place. But we have immediate access to God. Um, when I went to the university, uh, I inherited a secretary, one of the best secretaries I ever had. I liked her because she was a workaholic. And uh, I, I probably didn't like the fact uh, she would set up appointments for me at 8 o'clock at night. Why not? Because she was still there working, so he just as well meet people as well. But uh, uh, Nancy said to me one day, I'm not going to call your office anymore. I said, what's your problem? And she said, uh, you, that secretary intimidates me. And I said, why? Well, she said she, she doesn't act like she wants to let me talk to you. So I called her in, we had a little conference, and I said that there are two people that always have access to my office, and that's my wife and my son. Now when she calls, you can tell her what I'm doing and who's in there, but the decision whether she talks to me is not yours. That She can make that decision for herself. Well, aren't you glad that when we call God, we don't have to go through a secretary? <laughs> And the secretary says, may I tell him, please, who's calling? Oh, don't you hate that? And uh, uh, if, could, could I tell him the nature of the call? You, we have access to God. We have immediate access into his presence. We don't have, there is, we, there is only one mediator between God and man, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. We've got access into the presence of God, and how grateful and thankful we are for that. Now, thirdly, we must have plenty of healthy exercise. I believe that our exercise is our service for God. Oh, you people have already evidenced exercise exercise this morning because you have done the physical exercise of getting out of bed and getting to church that's good exercise you've done a wonderful thing already this morning but we can continue our spiritual exercise by serving our Lord uh, and this is just out of the abundance of our heart uh, Nancy and I were visiting in a church one day and somebody met us in the lobby and said uh, our job is to say good morning to you. I just felt so warm and welcome. <laughs> the only reason they greeted us because they had a job to do and they wanted to get their job done by saying good morning to us. The, the, to me, there was no service from the heart in that kind of uh, uh, attitude. But it's a wonderful thing. that we. And a lot of the things we do for God are things that nobody sees. They are the unseen things, but we do them in the name of Jesus, and we do it because of the love of Jesus. Uh, I like that little thing that they're talking about today, pay it forward. Instead of waiting for somebody to do something good for you, do something good for somebody, and let the Lord bless you, even, nobody, even if nobody sees it. And finally this morning, we need to get plenty of the right kind of rest. It's important to be spiritually fit that we have a regular relaxed rest and sleep. Some of us have, living, have lived such a driven life that we almost feel guilty if we relax. And H.B. last Sunday really 
helped us and he really nailed it in our approach to the new year that we get that we relax and we relax in the presence of God and in the promises of God and that we can live that kind of a life we will never get healthy restful sleep without peace of mind and a restful trust in the Lord and a quiet confidence in him Isaiah 26 3 says you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And the scripture that HB left with us last week, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Fears and anxiety will stunt our spiritual growth but a confidence and trust in him will cause us to grow now these are ways to grow in the new year and they are ways to become a strong Christian we must have plenty of good food plenty of fresh air just and we're blessed out here aren't we in the natural we've got a lot of fresh air um, I've told people before why I am so healthy because I've had a lot of fresh air in life Nancy has finally learned after a lot of years she says this every day now I hear her say this and I really appreciate it she says this every day are you finished with the newspaper <laughs> because she is on her way to the garbage can she didn't ask this for many years. I spent a lot of time in fresh air out of the garbage can reading, reading the newspaper. That's why I'm so healthy. Because I've, I've had fresh air every day. Because there's nothing laying around in our house. As soon as it's down, it's out. And, uh, but now she has asked that question, are you through with the paper yet? And as soon as I say yes, it's in the garbage can. It's ready, it's ready to be picked up. But we do need, we do need good food. We need fresh air, and uh, we need uh, the right kind of exercise, and then we need the confidence and the assurance and the rest that can only come from the Lord. So let us pray that we may grow in grace so that we may really come to know our Lord in a better and more personal way in 2015. Second Peter 3.18 says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be both the glory now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Let's pray that we may grow in understanding of his will. That we may find pleasure in doing the things that bring pleasure to God. Colossians 1.9 says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Let's pray that we may grow in love and communion with him. Ephesians 3.19 says, And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And then let us pray that we may ever be growing in faith. 2 Thessalonians 1.3 says, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is it right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Isn't that great? That, and that should be our desire that in 2015, our understanding of the will and the plan and the purpose of God continues to grow in all of us and that we love each other more. And that we come to the end of the year knowing that we have grown in the Lord, but we've also had an increase of love and appreciation for everyone around us. And as we grow in these ways, we will become stronger in 2015 than we were when we began this year. 
So this morning, we're going to sing our prayers on the back of your program. And as we sing, those of you that are going to assist us in the communion and uh, helping the folks in receiving the elements, I'm going to invite you to come as we sing and prepare for communion today. But this is our prayer now as we are approaching our new year.